thank you very much for joining us today. I, this is an exciting topic that I want to talk about because I'm going to discuss a, as a rhinologist at a tertiary level, what we do in our practice to really separate out the different types of sinus disease and how we manage them. Now, we all acknowledge that there are patients who come and see us who have very discrete focal anatomical problems <clears throat> in their sinuses. Now, these patients here are examples of people who have a discrete problem in one sinus. They don't really have evidence of broader airway inflammation. The problems here that exist in these patients are anatomically discrete. They're relatively straightforward to sort out. And this is where endoscopic surgery certainly does uh, is an enormous uh, value invention in, in improving these conditions. But I would pretend that this is not the typical patient that comes and visits an otolaryngologist. This is not who we see in day-to-day -day practice. They are great examples of anatomically or focally discrete problems, but this is the sort of patient that is typically seen in the community, someone who's developed patchy and diffuse sinus changes. And this patient doesn't have an anatomical problem or a discrete issue. They've developed an inflammatory response across their airway. This is not a patient with simple osteal occlusions. They are simply a patient who has an inflammatory reaction. Now, it's very important for me as a surgeon and as a rhinologist that I match up what I'm trying to achieve surgically with the condition. Now, we do have these great examples of anatomically discrete problems in the sinuses in, in which th there is just simply a plumbing or obstructive or ventilatory pathophysiology. And in those patients, simple sinus surgery in some of those tenets of how sinus surgery came about, it is a terrific solution. But at this end of the spectrum, where it's more about inflammation, what we do as surgeons cannot be the same foundation and principles as what's on the left-hand side of the spectrum. It is this group of patients in which we apply a very different type of surgery, one that's simply designed to create a simple cavity or near sinus cavity for the purposes of managing what we acknowledge is an inflammatory disorder. And so there is no point in my mind doing a ventilatory disorder for a condition that we know is inflammation and we don't necessarily have to open up all the sinuses in someone who has an anatomically discrete problem. The, the condition and surgery must be in harmony with what we're trying to achieve. Now, this is very important because when we see surgery applied where it's not in harmony with what is going on as a pathophysiology in the, in the patient, it becomes a problem. So if we fail to acknowledge that ventilation and plumbing is not really the cause of sinus disease, then you're going to lead to failure when it comes to managing sinus disease. But if we acknowledge that sinus disease is really constitutes a group of conditions in which inflammation and mucostasis, which is usually a secondary event, a major pathologic process, not just simply blockage and ventilation, then and we use surgery to break this process. This is when we'll have success. And on this side, it's really where our clinical practice is not in harmony with what we understand to be true from our knowledge of sinus disease. And on this side, this is where our understanding of sinus disease and what we're doing clinically are much more aligned. So let's talk about upper airway inflammation. This talk is about that diffuse inflammatory process. This patient here, who we're talking about. Now, how do we predict what sort of inflammation is going on in these sinuses? Um, we might look at the turbulence, look how congested the nose is. We might look at what sort of mucins coming out. Maybe they've got polyps, no polyps. But we can actually be more scientific about it. My colleagues in Europe, Thibaut Van Ziel, Galen Group, they, they try to endotype different sinus diseases, and they can clearly demonstrate that there's very distinct groups. However, the sort of biomarkers and testing here are not available to a practicing clinician. Now, what I think is important is that we acknowledge this. We sadly uh, are behind respiratory physicians when it comes to airway inflammatory research. And I think 
understanding that res respiratory physicians have been there and already been doing research in airway inflammation for many, many years is very important. And one of those people is Sally Wenzel. She, many years ago, six years ago now, that she wrote this article about asthma phenotype, I think is very poignant because this is about where we are at in our understanding of upper airway disease. Now, this graph is not shouldn't be intimidating. It just talks about severity um, on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis, we have the age of onset. And down below at the young age, we have those allergic conditions, classically IgE-mediated disease. In middle age, in the severe end, we have the eosinophilic disease patients. And then in the adults, we have a group of patients who are less eosinophilic and less corticosteroid responsive uh, as another phenotype. So I'm gonna use Sally's diagram here to tell you where we're at when it comes to management of the upper airway. Now, the first group is that of childhood and young adult asthma. These are people who get rhinitis, asthma, doctor, I've had sinus disease all my life. What they're really describing is chronic allergy of the airway. They often have childhood asthma. They have other atopic phenomena such as skin and contractile reactivity. And this is the allergic subset. Now, they may not have normal sinuses. There may be a small degree of sinus disease, and we're going to talk about how that appears. One of the markers, though, this is very important, of inhalant allergy is middle turbinate head edema. So when we look in the nose and see these polypoid-like changes coming off the turbinates, this is not nasal polyposis. This is a marker of inhalant allergy. And one of our PhD students, Anita Hammerson, many years ago, um, wrote a paper on the focal edematous change and polypoid edematous change that occurs in the turbinate head and said, how good a feature is this um, to predict someone's inhalant allergy status? So you can see down the diffuse and polypoid end. If you have a look at the numbers here, if you have diffuse or polypoid edema of your middle turbinate head, it is a very, very strong positive predictive value of having inhalant allergy. It's not a super sensitive, but a very strong positive predictive value. Now it's important because we see patients like this. This patient here has giant polypoid edema coming off their turbinate head and may look like some of nasal polyposis, but in fact, it's simply just polypoid edema off the turbinate. Some of these patients even present, this patient was sent to me, grade three polyps. And as you can see, there's a polyp in the front of the nose, but the sinuses are completely normal. This is an inhalant allergy phenomenon. Now, if you believe that, then you'll understand this concept. So John Delgardi is a very bright guy and he wrote about the concept of what we call central compartment atopic disease. This is where inhalant allergy changes of the turbinate and septum create this pattern of disease where everything's centrally thickened and maybe just a bit of mucus trapping in the sinuses or peripherally spared altogether. He coined this, this disease because he really saw it as being just this extension of all the polypoid change in allergic disease. We, we went on to try to, with John Delgado and his team, to show if we could support some data to this. So we looked at 106 patients who had allergy and sinus disease. And we said, let's, let's phenotype the pattern of disease, whether the frontal sinus here, an example, is it, completely normal, whether it has roof and lateral sparing, whether it was diffusely thickened or completely opacified. And we said, let's break these patients up into non-atopic and allergically sensitized patients. No surprises here, the allergics were maybe slightly younger um, and uh, otherwise very similar uh, in the groups as you might expect. And what we did then is we said, what is the pattern of disease? Can we predict a pattern in that allergically sensitized group? We went through several different phenotypes and not surprisingly, John Delgadio's original description, this concept of laterally and superiorly spared sinuses what we call phenotype B1, was the one that correlated best with allergic disease. And I love this thing here. That you know, you might say that Richard is only 70% versus 45%, but if you think of the number of confounders here, the fact that you can predict someone's allergy status just looking at the, the pattern of mucosal thickening on a CT scan is I think is astounding. So very convinced here. Now, but but you should never be convinced by just by one group. Um, you know, I've obviously bought into John Delgadio's concept here of central compartment atopic disease. But Ed McCool is a gentleman who is a rhinologist who works in the South. 
Um, he had seen similar pattern of disease in allergically sensitized patients in the south of the US. And he wrote this concept of middle turbinate polyposis, essentially this middle turbinate edema, and compared it to typical cyanonasal polyps. And so here we are, example of typical cyanonasal polyps from his paper, middle turbinate head edema, exactly what we're talking about. And what he showed here was that those patients who had middle turbinate head polypoid change, middle turbinate edema change, were likely to be younger, they were more likely to have allergic rhinitis, as you would expect, amazingly high, 83%, and less likely to have severe eosinophilic disease like aspirin exacerbated disease. So typically your pattern of someone who has inhalant allergy. Likewise, not surprisingly, that the NOSE score and lund mackay score is much less burden of disease in the simple turbinate edema polypoid change group compared to those people who have true diffuse polyposis. And so here's a great example of an external study that validates um, the same concepts that we're describing here in this patient group. So here's one of the scans that was sent to me by my colleague, uh, Rita Sansoni, who's an ex-fellow, 19-year-old girl with childhood asthma sent to him with sinus disease. And you can clearly see here now that he's saying, what a great case of central compartment disease. This girl's problem is not sinus disease. She may get some barotrauma when she flies, but her primary problem here is inhalant allergy. Now, just when we think we're clever doctors, you know, I, I read through one of Valerie Lund's old books and found that, you know, we really have to give credit to her amongst all the things that she did. She actually wrote about this in a book called Investigative Rhinology, and she called it the black halo sign. So amongst all the achievements that Valerie has done for our profession, here she is uh, a little gem in one of her books where she actually described this condition, you know, a decade or more ago. Um, and we've just recently put some data to it. Let's move on and talk about the second one here. Um, this is the group in which don't have any airway problems until they're in their 30s to 50s and all of a sudden develop asthma and nasal polyposis. Well, they get a viral event and ever since the virus, they've had asthma and polyposis. And if there is a, a story here of someone who has an allergy, they often say, I was allergic when I was younger and then I was well during my 20s and 30s and then my allergy returned. And of course, that's not really their allergy returning. They've just simply developed an inflammatory airway disease in the setting of someone who had allergy when they were younger. Now, this is classic cyanonasal polyposis and asthma. It's classically eosinophilic. And we know that it's an epithelial driven process where local innate lymphoid cells um, are patchily uh, distributed through the sinus mucosa and, and, and are activated. And that's why the condition is often patchy when we go in there and see it. So this is your eosinophilic CRS group. Now, they look very different in my opinion. These patients have a diffuse change. And when you look up at the middle meatus, you can see this typical polypoid edema secretions. This is someone whose inflammatory disease is very severe. They have a lot of symptoms, even though you might call this only a grade one or two polyp. When we diagnose this condition, we use tissue. So when we take them to surgery and we do a sample, we use this structured histopathology report it's freely available. Um, it's designed to be used of H&E stains by routine pathology. And it just helps you clarify some of the simple aspects of sinus disease, most of which has very good research now on clinical outcomes. And one thing here we're looking for is this concept of eosinophil activation. So we look at the tissue density of eosinophils in some very simple groupings. Um, we look at the degree of eosinophilic mucin and evidence of eosinophil activation with charcoal in crystals. People say, well, do I have to take tissue? Well, you can use a serum eosinophil as a biomarker. So when the serum eosinophil is high, at least as high as that or 0.3 or more, the positive pretty value is good. But if your serum eosinophils are not raised, then it's not a very good negative predictive value. And so that's perhaps the one problem here is when it's positive, it's good. And you have high serum eosinophils, but it's not something when it's, when it's within normal range, it's hard to exclude tissue eosinophilia. Importantly here in these patients who have significant tissue eosinophilia is their serum IgE, so a classic marker of simple inhalant allergy, doesn't predict their tissue eosinophilia. And I think this underlies the fact that this condition is not an inhalant allergy driven problem. This is an eosinophilic inflammatory airway condition that comes on as adults. Its origins are not a simple IgE mediated disease. Now these patients have a very different problem. One of the problems with these patients you know, despite being given simple nasal sprays, that nasal spray does not go to where it's required. So 
the disease is up here, back here, up in the frontal, even back in the sphenoid. And these patients need to get anti-inflammatory treatment into these areas. Now, there's a lot of information now about the impact of it, how you deliver topical therapy into the sinuses and whether or not you've surgically changed the anatomy as to how effective topical therapy gets into the paranasal sinuses. Where does our anti-inflammatory need, need to be? It doesn't need to be in here. This is where hay fever and rhinitis exist. These patients have severe inflammation throughout their sinuses in this zone here. And these patients will tell you when they take oral steroid, it's amazing. Their smell comes back, they do great. And that's because we're delivering the medicine into their sinuses systemically through their bloodstream. But of course, when we do that, we send as much to the big toe, the liver, the bones as well, with a lot of systemic exposure. And so the other way of delivering it in there is to do it locally. And to do it locally, you really have to create a simple sinus cavity for them and then give them some form of high volume irrigation um, with medication in it to deliver that local corticosteroid. Simple sprays simply do not get there. Now, we know this to be true from studies about where sprays go, but until recently, there wasn't a good randomized trial to really answer this question. Does how we deliver it impact the outcome in real patients in real life? And together with Ray Sachs, we published this last year, this randomized trial that we ran over a number of years demonstrating that corticosteroid irrigation supplied after a wide sinus cavity creation was much more effective than simple sprays uh, in a randomized placebo controlled fashion. So this was a study that we couldn't get funding from, from industry, it was investigator initiated, there's no patents here, it's just simply reformulating a, an already out of patent drug um, uh, in the sinus cavity. And we took patients who had a CRS, they were diffuse disease and so not focal problems, they failed therapy, um, they were adults and they didn't have systemic conditions. And we all did a style of surgery where it was designed to create a simple cavity or neo sinus or full house vest. We gave them corticosteroids for a standard period and antibiotics only if they were, had a positive culture. Now the intervention here then was that these patients added a, me a medicine to their irrigation bottle and then used a nasal spray afterwards. So all patients performed a once daily nasal irrigation followed by a spray and there was an active agent of mometazone, which was white base, odorless, and a placebo that looked exactly the same, but they didn't know which they were getting. So in the nasal irrigation, they either got mometazone or placebo, and in the spray, they either got mometazone or the placebo, but not both. And so we had two groups here, a placebo irrigation mometazone spray, a mometazone irrigation and placebo spray, this is how the bottles looked, completely controlled and placeboed, both to ourselves and the patients themselves. Now, we did questionnaires, endoscopy and a cone beam CT scan. Our primary outcome here was a VAS, a SNOT22 and a global function score, and secondary outcomes were radiology and endoscopy score. We had 44 patients in this trial. Here's the flow chart of how they broke up. The dropouts were very similar between both groups. And recruitment was over a couple of years and was only closed out in December of 2015 and was a year long follow up. So it only finished at the beginning of 2017. Um, this is the breakdown at baseline. So there were 23 in the mometazone spray and 21 in the mometazone irrigation. And they were very, very similar at baseline in terms of um, baseline demographics. Maybe there was slightly more aspirin exacerbated disease in the active irrigation group, um, but didn't reach quite significant. Let's have a look at their disease burden. So at baseline, their disease burden was very similar as well. There's really no difference between the symptoms or on, into, or on radiology of their disease burden. Now, this is what's important then, how they did overall. Now, very important, operating on patients, giving them a saline irrigation and a steroid spray actually brings about a benefit for all. So it's not as if, the, what we suspected to be the inferior arm provides no treatment. They all do well from the, this type of intervention. But the question is, does the irrigation group do better? And so what we can see here is a dramatic difference in nasal blockage VAS and a, and a dramatic difference in endoscopy and radiology scores between baseline at 12 months. Um, 
this is one of the best graphs here because the mometazone irrigation group are those in the yellow and they were all doing better at 12 months. But importantly, those in the spray group, there were quite a number of patients who were beginning to fail at 12 months. And I think this represents people with active disease that's simply not being treated by simple sprays because the sprays aren't getting into the actual sinus cavity. And therefore, it's not surprising when you look at the 12 month follow up here that the two groups break very significantly in several scores and overall VAS between the active irrigation and spray group despite being similar at baseline. Now, the endoscopy score, uh, this was only at 12 months because uh, we only scored the open cavity. Mometazone irrigation had a much lower volume of disease, demonstrating better control of disease. And there was a much greater reduction in inflammatory burden when it came to the mometazone um, irrigation group on CT score. And so here's an example of a patient who was in the trial and they were on the active agent and this is what their cavity looks like post-surgery. Now you might take this and think that, okay, so you need to do surgery to control all CRS who have eosinophilic disease. That's not true. We do see mild patients, just like people have mild asthma. Maybe they just need to wash a bit of mucus out of their nose. They don't they hardly need any treatment. Then there's gonna be the odd person who gets a bit of nasal congestion, occasionally with viral events flares up, just like some asthmatics don't need to treat their asthma unless they get a viral event. And then this is when they present to ENT surgeons, you know, they, they really have significant burden of disease and they need to take systemic treatments to either treat flares or reduce the overall burden of their inflammation. And you can probably do that two to three weeks at a time for two to three times a year before you enter a zone if you, of significant systemic absorption. If, so if you do that year in, year out, you're probably putting patients at risk of side effects from corticosteroid use. And at that point, that's when I talk to patients about doing surgery, where the goal here is shifting them from reliance on systemic or tablet medicine to a regular local treatment to control their condition. Now, let's go in the last few minutes to talk about this last group. This last group is here. This is this non-eosinophilic patient. These are patients who don't seem to respond to corticosteroids very well. They're slightly older often, but they may not look so different. So here's a patient who was sent to me who's female over 50, polyp change. You might say that the mucus looks a bit creamy rather than typically eosinophilic. And I said to her, you know, no problems. I know what we'll do. We'll, we'll, we'll redo your surgery and put you on a steroid irrigation. And this is what she looks like at three months. Really absolutely no difference. And I should have known because Beforehand, you know, she fits some of these criteria that have been seen in this non eosinophilic low airway equivalent. Um, slightly overweight, no polyps, um, low IgE, corticosteroid insensitive. These are some of the things that have been promoted maybe as, as picking out this phenotype. But we can be more scientific because we actually have that tissue sample, that biopsy that we spoke about before. And this is actually this lady's biopsy. Now, if you can see the summary diagnosis here was allergic slash inflammatory polyps. But actually, if you have a look up here, she's got less than 10 eosinophils in her field and she's got quite focal neutrophilic infiltrate. These are neutrophils sitting in the epithelium here. And so she's someone who really doesn't have eosinophilic disease. And this is the patient that we put on macrolides. The macrolides have a real role in managing airway inflammation, but it's just that they're not good for eosinophilic disease. And so here she is now, three months after macrolide, it's less than a subtle response, it's a complete response. And this is what I think we see in macrolide responders. And her lower airway, which was traditionally poorly controlled with inhaled therapies, got better as well. So the question remains, which patients will respond to macrolide immunomodulation? So we did a little study here. This is Gretchen Oakley, who works in Utah. Um, she looked at macrolide responders, people who had this dramatic response that you can see here. And we said, what, what was different about them? Not many patients here. There's not a big group that we put on macrolides. But the macrolide responders were here on the left-hand side and those who didn't respond to macrolides on the right. The, the SNOT22 here is slightly higher in the macrolide response. There might be more severe disease. Um, and the features here that was significant is the macrolide responders were less likely to have a raised serum eosinophil, much less likely to show any form of tissue eosinophil infiltrate, and they were less likely to have established squamous metaplasia. So squamous metaplasia where you lose your cilia and then I think you have a non-functional cavity is, is really a whole uh, topic for another talk. 
but these things hadn't set in in the macrolide responder group. So in my summary, the macrolide responders have low serum eosinophilia, low tissue eosinophilia, and they have absence of remodeling, such as glamorous metaplasia. No, so to summarize here, for the inflammatory patient, we still create a simple sinus cavity. It's not a plumbing or ventilation problem. There's many things that doing this allows. It allows for topical therapy, overcomes mucostasis, overcomes obstructive phenomena such as barotrauma, pressure, and it does probably reduce overall inflammatory load. But then I think of Sally Wenzel's diagram and I, and I make a real attempt to say, what am I doing now? Now that I've created a, a, and overcome some of the mechanical issues that come about from having inflammation in the airway, how am I gonna treat the mucosa here? I really put the patients into these three groups, acknowledging that those in early life likely have allergic disease. This is where we push maybe simple nasal sprays is all that required because you're treating allergy. Immunotherapy we introduce early on. And other biologics such as omeluzumab, which is an anti-IgE, probably have a role here. Now, but when it comes to that adult onset nasal polyposis asthma patient, these are patients in which we do push corticosteroid treatment hard. We want to make sure we deliver it in the lowest risk way. So we create a cavity and give it to them as an irrigation. That I had some patients in traditionally, we used to be on low corticosteroid, uh, corticosteroid treatment systemically. In, in addition to that, patients who pick themselves out for needing systemic treatment often do so because their lungs aren't controlled with inhaled therapies either. But most of those patients in recent years have transitioned into biologics such as mepolizumab. And then finally here, we go looking for the patient who really looks like they're corticosteroid non-responsive and lacks tissue eosinophilia. And this is your macrolide responder. Uh, and this is where we, we try to apply a low dose macrolide, really looking for a dramatic response within the first 90 days on treatment, um, if you've picked it right. And so I wanna leave us today on that talk, really demonstrating how we go about at a tertiary rhinology uh, uh, center of breaking down our CRS patients and directing their treatments um, post-surgery to make sure we achieve the best outcomes and not using fancy laboratory biomarkers, but, but phenotype characteristics that are available now that we can use to help delineate um, how we should proceed with treatment. Thanks very much.